from the United States. My name is Sandra Steingraber. I'm a PhD biologist and distinguished scholar in residence at Ithaca College. I'm also a co-founder of New Yorkers Against Fracking and a concerned health professional for the North. I also serve as science advisor for Americans Against Fracking. My task today is to speak to you about the collective state of mind in the United States in regards to fracking. The word I think of first is an old English word, hoodwink. To hoodwink means to trick, cheat, or deceive. But the original meaning of the word in William Shakespeare's day was to blind someone by placing a hood over their eyes. By both definitions, Americans have been hoodwinked. We are now waking up to that fact, which is to say that as time goes by and the evidence for fracking's harm increases, more and more people perceive a disconnect between the reassuring narratives of the industry and the nightmare of living, moving, scaling a fracking operation. They see their local roads filled with trucks hauling hazardous materials, their suite may be disturbed by noise and light pollution that goes on nonstop for many months. Their drinking water might turn bad. They may become sick from air pollution. They see that the gas reserves in the promised jobs have been overhyped, and as a result, people feel foolish. In response, grassroots efforts have rapidly mobilized and are beginning to coalesce into a powerful social movement. Journalists, professors, and college students all like to write about the U.S. anti-fracking movement and filmmakers now document our struggle. We are a political phenomenon. Uh, nonetheless, our efforts are slow compared to the gold rush speed at which fracking has propelled itself across the landscape. The gas and oil industry enjoys a long head start. It also employs many lobbyists to help shape the legal rules by which fracking will be practiced. And in the United States, these rules are largely written by individual state governments. One lesson that we have learned is that regulations serve as a green light to this industry. Once the legal rules are in place that govern how fracking will proceed, it's very difficult for communities to say no and push it out altogether. Fracking is a capital-intense industry. It requires a network of extensive infrastructure that includes not just a multitude of wells spread across the landscape, but also roads, condensers, air shafts, pipelines, compressor stations, and waste pits. Fracking brings with it mass industrialization of the rural landscape. Once these investments are made and infrastructure laid down, fracking is very difficult to dislodge. And because shale and oil gas extraction via fracking is a complex operation with many moving parts, the regulations are also complex. Here in New York, we've successfully maintained a moratorium on fracking, and we've prevented permissive regulations from kicking forward, largely by arguing two points. First, because the rules are necessarily so complex, their enforcement is not possible in a budget-constrained world. And second, and more importantly, we point to the damning science, now finally trickling in, which shows that fracking is inherently dangerous to human health, and to that part of the environment, namely water, air, and climate, on which long-term economic vitality depends. Data show that fracking is not safe as it's currently practiced, and no evidence exists to say that it can be made safe through regulation. Indeed, some of the many risks of fracking now appear unmanageable, and the many harms so created inherent to the system and unfixable. Thus, like lead paint, asbestos, DDT, and smoking in airplanes, fracking, we argue, needs to be banned rather than regulated. I'll close by telling you more about the emerging evidence for harm, but first let me give you a historical perspective on fracking in the United States, which I think helps explain why both the science on fracking and our political movement have been slow to arise. Fracking and I'm using uh, that word here as a shorthand for the entire process of shale gas and oil exploration and extraction by a high volume horizontal drilling. Uh, fracking was first developed in remote western areas where a few people were exposed to its harm. And
And then in 2005, it received exemption from the fee provision of our national environmental laws. And this means that fracking enjoys the chemical equivalent of diplomatic immunity. It is free to ignore laws that other industries must follow. Companies involved with fracking are not required to monitor hazardous air pollutants, nor find it killing methane that leaks from all parts of the extraction and distribution system. Companies involved with fracking are not compelled to disclose the names of the toxic chemicals they pour down their holes, nor do they need to track nor safely contain the hazardous radioactive waste that comes back out of these holes. These legal exemptions allowed fracking to spread quickly, and it moved east into densely populated states like Pennsylvania, where public health risks were greater. But the secrecy provided by these legal exemptions, along with the non-disclosure agreements that companies routinely include in their leasing agreements with the landowner, meant that public health scientists could not easily measure chemical exposures, nor could affected people openly talk about the ways in which they were harmed. In Pennsylvania, even the doctors who treat people made sick by fracking are bound by gag orders. New studies now show that the inability to gather data on emissions, on chemicals, on exposures, on human illnesses themselves have impeded the progress of science. Thus, if science itself blindfolded, hoodwinked, if you will, to the dangers of fracking. Three new peer-reviewed medical papers published just this month all conclude that the public health research on the health effects of fracking has been held hostage by industry secrecy. I emphasize this point because although Europe may promulgate different legal arrangements for fracking, we in the United States, where fracking was born, cannot offer you a comprehensive list of all possible human health risks. We simply don't know them. Let me summarize for you a few things that we do know. First, air pollution in the form of smog accompanies fracking wherever it goes. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has identified drilling and fracking operations as a leading source of smog in the otherwise pristine areas of the West. And the American Lung Association data now show that air quality in rural areas with fracking is worse than air quality in urban areas. There are costly health consequences to smog, which is definitively linked to asthma, stroke, heart attack, and low birth weight. Emerging data show elevated rates of childhood asthma in heavily fracked areas of, of Texas, elevated rates of birth defects in heavily fracked areas of Colorado, and increased risk to low birth weight among infants born to mothers residing near gas wells in heavily fracked areas of Pennsylvania. These are all terribly expensive problems whose monetized costs need to be projected. We also know from industry's own data and from data collected from the state of Pennsylvania that 5% of wells are structurally compromised and fail immediately. That proportion increases with age as cement cracks, shrinks, and hardens. This engineering problem sets the stage for water contamination, and that is exactly what the data show. Newspaper investigations have confirmed drinking water contamination from drilling and fracking operations in four states, Texas, Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. With 161 cases of confirmed water contamination in Pennsylvania alone. These findings are corroborated by university studies. A University of Texas study finds fracking linked to arsenic contamination in drinking water, while a pair of studies from Duke University documents elevated levels of methane, ethane, and propane in groundwater near fracking. The University of Missouri study finds endocrine disruptors in both fracking chemicals and in water collected near drilling operations, including the Colorado River itself. The health consequences of fracking can also take the form of social blight. Studies show that when fracking arrives in a community, so too arrive increased rates of crime, drug abuse, drunk driving, and rape. Those are just a few of the studies of the 150 studies now published on the health effects of fracking in the peer-reviewed literature. Over half of these 150 studies have appeared just in the last 12 months. So with these emerging data, the real costs of fracking are finally coming into focus, and the unhoodwinking of America is underway. So I would like to close with an apology rather than with a note of silence. The environmental community in the United States, of which I'm a member, took a conciliatory stance on fracking many years ago with the excuse that 
natural gas was somehow less bad in its way for health and the climate. It's not. But by our own silence, U.S. environmental groups enabled this harmful form of fossil fuel extraction to gather power and speed. Fracking is my country's worst exploit. You may not hear this from anyone else, but I am sorry, as an American, that fracking is now selling misery across the Atlantic. It's a brutal, primitive technology that brings temporary riches to a few and permanent ruin to many. I pledge myself to your good efforts to halt fracking in the European Union.